Lord, as that word is told out, as your name is proclaimed, we ask that the power of the Holy Spirit may come upon each one of us, both speaker and listeners alike. And Lord, that we may know that you are with us. We pray that you will make clear your word. And Lord, that we may take it with us as we go into a new week, ready to follow you and to walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, an old uh, preacher, Uncle Bud, he said that pride is the only disease known to man that makes everyone sick except the one who has it. Everyone sick except the one who has it. And pride is what called the downfall of uh, Satan, his desire to be like God most high. And then pride, of course, is what caused the downfall of Adam and Eve, wanting to be like God. And they were tempted by Satan's words that, yes, you will be like God. Pride is, to some extent, what has also caused the downfall of uh, Boris Johnson as Prime Minister of the UK. And perhaps the most sickening of all is spiritual pride, where certain people claim a spirituality above their peers, a holier-than-thou attitude, an attitude that says, I'm further on than you. Of course, this kind of pride is not spiritual at all, for true sp spirituality manifests itself like Christ in all humility. And in Colossae, the false teachers were offering a spirituality which they claimed to have attained through a number of ways that we shall consider in a moment. They looked down on the average Christian who knew Christ and offered a superior way, they said, to be like God. It's quite natural for us as Christians to want to be like God in the right sense and to desire a greater spirituality than he or, he or we already have. But these desires must be channeled in the right way. And so Paul warned them against this deception of the false teachers. And later on in chapter 3, he showed them how to grow to be more like Christ, more like God, and become more spiritual. First of all, though, Paul gives three don'ts. Don't let anyone judge you, verses 16 to 17. Don't let anyone disqualify you, verses 18 to 19. And don't submit to, do's, uh, to don'ts in verses 20 to 23. So, first of all, don't let anyone judge you, verses 16 to 17. And we saw last time that the false teaching was hollow and deceptive based on human wisdom and the ABC of certain worldly principles. And Paul goes on to show what else these teachings and why, rather than setting us free, they bring us into greater slavery. The false teachers were judgmental concerning the Colossian Christians because of their attitude to food and to drink, to festivals and to seasons. And to them, anyone who wanted to be truly spiritual had to conform to their way of thinking. It's always a dangerous thing, isn't it? And food restrictions, special diets, observance of special ceremonies and days obviously come out of the old Jewish practices. And these were being imposed on the Christians as a necessary part of their spiritual development. It's true that certain disciplines can be of tremendous benefit in Christian growth. So things like prayer and fasting, meditation on the scriptures, uh, Sunday worship, Bible study, but not if they're done out of a sense of compulsion. If you're just going through the motions because you believe that's what is expected of you and that's what will make you accepted amongst Christians, then you've missed the point. I think as we're going through the minor prophets, we've just seen that what is important is the heart. And if you've become a slave to externals, then the heart has taken a back seat. What matters is the heart, and your heart may well call you to such disciplines, but don't just do them to avoid the judgment of others. And so in chapter 3, Paul will elaborate on our heart's desires for Christ. But for the moment, don't feel compelled by the opinion of others to fall into certain patterns. Christ has set us free. Don't become a slave again to empty ritualism. Heartfelt worship, yes, but not empty ritualism. 
Similarly, if we're tempted to judge others as unspiritual, let us be aware of spiritual pride in ourselves. That's so easy, isn't it? And I know that only too well for myself. The Old Testament rituals had a place in God's plan as pictures of things yet to come. They were mere shadows, but the one casting the shadow is Christ himself. So imagine you're walking along the street on a bright sunny day and as you approach a corner, you see the shadow of a person coming along around that corner. And the shadow helps you to prepare yourself for what is to come. It may even help you surmise whether the person you're about to meet is male or female. But once you have both reached that corner, you don't bother with the shadows. You look at the person. And that's, that's the key, isn't it? The Old Testament, with all of its laws for food and festivals, it pales into insignificance when we come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. An engaged couple, having been corresponding across the seas, think of them. The girl treasures every letter and goes over each line again and again. And then one day there is a knock at the door. Your fiancé is here. Does she ignore the call and carry on pouring over those letters line by line? No, she runs to meet the one that she loves. To have him in person is far better than having those letters. And so with Christ, he is the substance. He is the reality. And if you have Christ, then, you don't, don't, then don't let anyone judge you concerning those shadows, those externals. Your sufficiency is in Christ. And then secondly, don't let anyone disqualify you, verses 18 and 19. You see, the false teachers would disqualify the believer who has not shared in their secrets. Verse 18, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Greek athletes had to follow a, a, a very strict code, a regime, if you like, of discipline in their training before they were even allowed to enter into the Greek games. The umpire would assess each athlete and judge whether they were allowed to enter the contest and so win the prize or whether they would be disqualified. And the false teachers were here setting themselves up as umpires and disqualifying the believers by their own rules. They boasted in their spirituality. In fact, they even boasted of their humility. Can you believe that? But such humility is a false humility. Indeed, what they were doing was to humiliate themselves by these ascetic practices, treating their bodies harshly. And in many places, that is what people think will draw them nearer to God. You may have seen pictures of the Hindu fakir, the one who um, lies on a bed of nails or maybe walks through burning coals. In the Philippines, I've seen people who carry a heavy cross on Good Friday and sometimes have them, themselves tied to it through the heat of the day. Uh, one or two may even dare to be nailed to the cross. Others walk through the streets flailing their backs uh, with, with these leather thongs. And so, uh, as they look upon those different ways of uh, treating themselves, they feel that by that they're drawing closer to God. Another example would be in Ireland, where every year on the last Sunday of July, uh, there are some 25 plus thousand people, pilgrims, who climb Croagh Patrick to do penance, a very rocky mountain. And some walk up the rocky path barefoot, while others will even crawl on their bare knees, seeking forgiveness from God. And all of this is false humility, and it will get them nowhere. The false teachers also boasted in their worship of angels. It seems likely that this was the false teacher's way of making connection with God through the mediation of angels. You remember how the heresy thought of a hierarchy of spiritual beings emanating from God all the way down until it came to man. And so there were certain religious ceremonies that had to be performed in relation to these spirit beings in order to get through to God. 
And I think we've uh, already seen how this is still with us today in the, the psychic world and other occult practices. There is a parallel too in the reverence given to saints and the Virgin Mary who are seen as mediators between God and man. So all of this is false teaching. And the false teachers also boasted about the visions that they had, the ones that they felt had come from God. And God does indeed give visions to people, but we're always warned to test the spirits to see whether they come from God or from the devil. And the word Paul uses here was most commonly used of entering into a higher plane of the mystery religions, uh, that people being initiated into secrets that brought the devotee amongst the spiritual elite. Up here we are now. And a modern parallel would be entering higher levels of Freemasonry or even Mormon church. In other words, these false teachers were not receiving their visions from God. And far from being spiritual then, these false teachers were puffed up with pride and sticking to the old ways. And their inflated egos, their sense of self-importance, caused them to lose connection with the head, with Christ, in whom all of the fullness of the Godhead lives. And their supposed authority came from the visions that they claimed to have received and their human reasoning without reference to Christ as the head of the church. By contrast, Christ's body, the church, of which he is the head, is nourished and knit together by God himself. They don't need the worship of angels to connect them to God. They are connected already through the Lord Jesus Christ. And their spiritual development comes not from rituals and ceremonies, but from their relationship with God through Christ. In Christ, they have all of the resources that they need to grow as they trust in the work that Christ completed on the cross. As believers remain connected to Christ, so they will be nourished by him and bound together in complete harmony within the fellowship of the church. Is that your experience? Do you feel that, that, that connection with the living God through Jesus Christ? Because that's what he wants, that's what God desires. And furthermore, Christ's body, the church, will grow strong in contrast to those who follow human traditions and wisdom. The false teachers would disqualify the believers. But as we saw back in chapter 1, it is God the Father who qualifies believers through Christ's death, who makes us fit not only to run in the race, but to win the prize. It's all by his grace that we can claim that hope of glory, the hope of being in God's presence forever, vitally connected to him by love. And there are still those today who boast of their experience. They may boast of their style of worship, their times of fasting, even up to 40 days, the visions that they've had, their multi-million pound refurbishments. And we may feel intimidated by these things and useless, but our power is in the Lord. And that, what is important is our walk, our walk with him, not our talk. So don't let anyone disqualify you for the prize. And then thirdly, don't submit to don'ts. Now that may sound a contradiction, but essentially we're talking about the rules and the regulations that come from the hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world mentioned in verse 8. Paul reminded them what he'd said in verse 12, that they had died with Christ to the basic principles of the, this world, the ABC, if you like, of man's religion. And the word principles means uh, things in a row, and it came therefore to meet the alphabet, as the letters in the alphabet are often lined in a row. And this is the starting point for any serious education. We must learn our ABC. And hence the word has that connotation of elementary teaching, the rudiments of basic principles. And the ABC of man's religion tells us to work our way up to heaven by our own efforts. Be as good as you can and you might reach the top. But we become slaves to rules and regulations. Do this, don't do that. But God's truth tells us that we are sinners in need of a saviour, that God in his grace has provided a saviour that saviour is Christ, and that by faith in him we enter the kingdom of heaven. 
we are no longer under the rules and the regulations that were demanded by our earlier attempt to scale the heights to heaven. And we're free from all of these, uh, the power of these rules and regulations. As we read last week, they were nailed to the cross of Christ. They were completely negative, a series of don'ts. And perhaps these false teachers refused to marry or to let people marry, refused to eat certain kinds of food, refused to mix with people outside of their circle of enlightened disciples. And Paul mentions again their self-imposed worship and rituals, their false humility, their asceticism, treating the body harshly. All of these things have an appearance of wisdom, but they fail utterly for two reasons. Firstly, because these things are destined to perish. All human commands and teachings are going to perish. They are used and that's it, they're gone. But the Bible repeatedly tells us to love the Lord our God and to walk in obedience to him. It is again the heart that matters. Love God and you will keep his commandments. Secondly, rituals and harsh treatment of the body fail to connect us to God and make us like him because they are ineffectual in restraining our self-centered indulgences. They lead to pride. And without Christ, we continue in our pride, in our selfishness, in our greed. Without him, we continue as hypocrites. And the spirituality offered by the false teachers turns out to be a waste of time, an empty promise. Far from drawing us nearer to God, they cut us off from God. So why submit to these rules and regulations that rob us of freedom? If you really want to grow in faith and overcome temptation, then look to Christ. You'll find in some parts of the Christian church worldwide teachings like those of the false teachers in Colossae. They will teach that Christians should never drink, they should never dance, they should never smoke, never go to the cinema, never play cards, never wear makeup, never wear jewellery. It's all a list of don'ts. And those um, who accept them look down on those who don't live that way. It encourages spiritual pride. So beware of spiritual pride that will cut you off from Christ. And the approach to living the Christian life is called legalism, if you're living like that. And it brings us back into slavery. It takes away our freedom in Christ. Our freedom still has responsibilities, as we will see in chapter 3 next week but we're not to be legalistic. There must be a balance, as also in our society, where we need to recognise the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, so much under threat in our own day. And so don't submit to the don'ts of the world. Rather submit yourself to Christ as head. Obey him out of love and enjoy the freedom that he gives. Let us then grow in Christ and grow like Christ, as we seek to walk humbly in connection with Christ as our head. Shall we pray together? Lord, we have to confess before you that every human being has within him that desire to be bigger, greater, stronger, more powerful. Lord, pride rears its ugly head at every corner. And we do pray that you will deal with us, that we may indeed humble ourselves before you and may know your indwelling power by your Holy Spirit to live in the way that pleases you, not to uh, try and please other men, but to please you, the living Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll help us in this week. Lord, that where we're tempted to spiritual pride or any type of pride, that you will once again just humble us and lead us back to the cross, to that place where we see our Saviour having died for us, that we might be forgiven, that we might be set free from all of the bondage to our rules and regulations. And we do pray that we may know that ongoing uh, walk with you, Lord, that we may be humble, that we may walk with our God, and that we may know him and the power of his resurrection. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's uh, sing our final hymn. Years I spent in vanity and pride. Well, isn't that true of 
all of us, that there was a time when we looked back to an emptiness and also that pride within us that said that we are the people that can run our own lives. And yet we find that liberty in Christ as he pardons us. So we'll sing together, Years I Spent in Vanity and Pride. Mm -hmm. 